Okay, everyone, thank you all for joining us in this session. Uh, please use your ODS event app to read the session at the end, as it helps us share or uh, shape our future conferences. There's also a chance to win a prize when you mention hashtag ODSC Best on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I know that this is the last workshop of the day, and y'all are just ready to leave. So without further ado, I'll introduce Kyle Kerber, who is the co-founder and CEO at Vega, and he's going to provide a demo talk about data observability for data science teams. Uh, let's give him a big round of applause for him. Thank you. I know everybody is ready to go to the bar, uh, so uh, we'll try and on time. Um, but uh, thanks for coming to my talk, and uh, good morning. Uh, sorry, I give my talks in UTC time. I'll switch to time zone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Kyle. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder at Big Eye. I'm going to be talking to you about data observability, and obviously everybody here is uh, in data science or around data science, so we're going to talk about data observability specifically from the data science context. Uh, before I get going, uh, how many of you have been to a talk either yesterday or today that you felt was overly technical? Okay. How many of you have been to a talk that was not technical? More of those. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to try to strike the right balance. Um, there's going to be a high-level overview about what data observability is, sort of where the concept came from, um, how I got introduced to it. Also, how it works. We're going to break down sort of the fundamental concepts behind how data observability uh, works in practice. We're going to talk a bit about how it benefits data science teams, and then we'll be giving a brief demo at the end uh, about the product that my company makes. So I left my previous job to work specifically on this topic. Uh, we obviously made the data observability platform, so I'll show you how that works, uh, and then we'll go over some of the concepts we talked about first. But without further ado, uh, let's talk first about why data observability. So why is this even the topic? Many of you might have heard about this recently, but why did this come under the radar the last couple of years? Um, so the way that I got involved with data observability was because of my work uh, on the data platform team originally at Uber. So I started there in 2013 as a data scientist. Uh, during the time between 2013 and 2018, I watched the company grow from a couple hundred people to 20, 30,000 people. And what that meant is the number of people at the company that were working with data in some fashion also exploded. So we went from I don't know, 10, 20 people that were working with data when I joined to 3,000 people a week when I left that were either running a query, creating a dashboard, some form of analytics, they were adding a new model um, to our machine learning platform, creating an ETL pipeline. So this is a lot of people that were working with our data internally. A lot of them didn't know each other. They didn't know what data that they had available to work with in the data lake or the data warehouse. There's a ton of questions about how do I even get my work done when it comes to working with data. Uh, so I joined the data platform team and moved from being a data scientist to being a product manager in 2015. Uh, and one of the first products that I led my team to launch was a data catalog tool, which you see on the screen. This was called Databook. Um, so a form of Databook still exists uh, at Uber today. It doesn't quite look like this anymore. Um, but the goal of this product was to help data scientists around the company look for the data sets that they wanted to work with. So we had about 100,000 tables in the data lake at the time several thousand ETL pipelines, it's difficult to know even what uh, table should I be working with if I'm trying to perform a particular analysis. So what we tried to answer with tools like Databook was, can I have a search portal for all of the data across the entire company that helps me find the data set that I want to work with for modeling, for analytics, or whatever I need to do with, uh, with data at the company. So one of the first problems that people ran into is like, okay, great, I can go find like the trips table, I can go find the driver table, I can go find a table that has to do with fraud, um, but how do I know if that table is reliable or not? Um, so uh, what we see here uh, are some basic statistics that we would collect about every table that was in the data warehouse. So we could show you things like row counts per partition. We could show you when the table was last loaded. But what we didn't originally tell you was anything about the quality of the data in the table. So we wouldn't tell you if that table was actually reliable enough to use for analytics. Uh, and if ultimately your analytics are supposed to end up in a production use case, that's a pretty important question. So how did we start to deal with that? Well, we built a, another product. Uh, what you see here on the left is called Trust. And Trust was a sort of side product along with Databook that helped to address this data quality challenge. Now, the way Trust worked is you would go into this interface and you would create a data pipeline test. Data pipeline test is some SQL code that you write. We run it for you on a schedule uh, using our ETL orchestrator. And we're going to run queries on your tables for things like, is the row count today within some range of the row count yesterday? So if the row count yesterday was 100,000, 
100,000 rows, and today it's only 80,000 rows, that might be a problem. Uh, we could also check things like, do we have duplicates in an ID column? Do we have negative values in a column of transactions? Uh, hilariously, there would sometimes be tricks that had a negative distance, uh, so somehow the car went you know, backwards or something, I don't know. Um, so we could write tests for these types of problems and then run checks in our pipelines continuously to identify them, and then we could send alerts about those failures to the person who wrote the check. So this might be the data scientist or the data engineer who created the table or the pipeline. We could also push them, as you see on the right, into the data catalog, and from the data catalog, we could push them into the query editor. So we could start to put directly at the fingertips of the data scientists information about the quality of the data that they're working with. Um, so if we go back here, when I go to look at a table now, I can not just see basic statistics about the structure of the table, the documentation, when it was last loaded, but I can now start to see these test statuses here that tell me things about the content of the table itself. So we could even write very complex tests that look for uh, qualities that have to do cross table, cross column. We could do things with distributions and I could set up checks to tell me if a distribution has drifted recently. So the, the great thing about these checks is they're as flexible as whatever you can express in SQL. Anyone want to guess what the downside of writing a bunch of SQL checks is? Writing a bunch of SQL checks? Writing a bunch of SQL checks, yes, that's the downside. So nobody actually wants to go into a testing system and create a whole bunch of data pipelines. People want to do modeling, they want to do analytics, they want to use the data. Um, there were a couple of like hero people around the company who would go in and like very like carefully test out all, all of these tables to make sure that they were okay, but like we can't run a business on a few heroes, right? Um, so what did we do about this? Uh, and the answer is this is where data observability starts to come from, right? It's answering this question of how do we find out about problems and pipelines before they get into models, before they get into analytics products, but how do we do it without an army of data engineering hours or an army of data science hours that could be better spent on actually doing uh, science? So to talk about how observability actually works in practice, first let's come up with a, a model of the pipeline here. So all the way on the right, we've got our users, and our users are interfacing with our application. So again, for me at Uber, this was you know, the mobile app. Um, and in this case, I've got a very simple application stack. We've got a database, we've got an EC2 instance, we've got a caching layer, a React front end. We have some software engineers. These are our best friends, right? Uh, they don't break anything ever. Um, at the top, uh, working on our application. And then all the data from that application goes into our data engineering friends over here that run our data pipelines. Uh, and this might be a stack, of, let's say Snowflake, Airflow, DBT, you know, something like that. And then the data that's going through our pipeline, that ends up at our desk, right? So we're working and we're doing our modeling in TensorFlow or Scikit or Keras or whatever. We're building our model, we're putting it in production, and the data for our model and those recommendations ultimately go to our users, completes the loop, comes back, and we've got this virtuous cycle of data. So the problem here is, uh, like I said, things go wrong. So uh, what these are called, these are called OSMs. Anyone know what an OSM is? Oh shit moments, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so most people have had an oh shit moment before. Um, if you haven't, good for you. Um, but most of us have experienced one of these. Something goes wrong in the pipeline, ends up in the model. Our users have a bad time. This is what we want to uh, protect against, right? So, but like I said earlier, uh, what we really want to do is we want to detect that OSM as soon as it occurs. We probably want to flag it to the data engineering team, right? So they're the ones that are going to be able to go in and do a backfill. Uh, fix an airflow job, figure out what somebody messed up in a DBT job code, you know, something like that. Um, so what we want to do is we want to catch the OSM as early as possible, somewhere in the pipeline, we want to alert the right people. So, let me push this over, okay, and then I'm going to pull my data engineers over here, and now in the middle we're going to talk about the actual components uh, of the data observability system, and I'm going to have a drink of water here, enjoy the graphic. Okay, so uh, space in between. Let's get the data scientists over here too. Um, so in the middle, there's a few basic components in an observability system. So if anybody's ever worked in SRE or DevOps, you might recognize these. So in DevOps, uh, we're talking about observability. We talk about uh, metrics, logs, and traces. This is the sort of usual trifecta for doing observability for infrastructure, application performance, things like that. Now in data, we can take the same idea and map it onto a data pipeline, but we're not going to have metrics, logs, and traces. We're going to have metrics, data, and lineage, uh, and then we need alerts to you know, actually tell people that there's something wrong to go and look at. 
So let's start breaking down these components. First, let's start with metrics. Metrics can mean a lot of things. So what does a metric mean in this context? So this is an example of a metric about a data pipeline, in particular about one table in the data pipeline. So here we're looking at the number of rows inserted per day over the last 30 days in a table. And what we can see is that we've got our uh, anomaly detection envelope here, uh, and we can see we've got some uh, different number of rows inserted per day, a couple thousand, uh, and then over here suddenly we have a big increase. So this might be because somebody did a Cartesian join by accident. Very bad, don't do that. Um, this might be because somebody ran a job too many times, like who knows, uh, but the point is that we're tracking the number of rows that are inserted, and then we can start to do things with that information, like alert people when we're doing something wrong in the pipeline. So this is a metric, but a metric could be a lot of other things. It could be the rows inserted, like I just said, but it could also be the freshness of the table. So when was it last updated with new records? It could be the query volume on the table, how many queries are being executed on the table. Uh, and these are all things that are derived from metadata. So these are very cheap for us to collect from most data stores. So any columnar data store, a big query, a redshift, a snowflake, they store query logs about all the queries executed on the platform. It's very cheap and easy to parse those logs and pull out these basic statistics. Uh, or metrics about table behavior. A little more interesting are these query-derived metrics. So the query-derived metrics, this is for attributes of the data that you can't pull out from metadata. You need to directly interrogate the data set. Uh, and so at Uber, the way that we would do this is by running these basic stats checks on every table on a cycle once a day or every, every couple days, depending on how important the table was, and then reporting these over time. But these are expensive to run on the data store. Uh, so you need to be kind of judicious and selective with these, but for those tables that are really important because they drive a critical analytics product or they drive a model that's in production, you need these to understand what's going on inside the data set itself. And even better if you can split them out by dimensions. Um, so these are metrics. So that's the first piece. Next piece is the data. So like I said in DevOps, uh, this piece would be logs. So if I'm a, an SRE, I'm responding to a problem with an application, I see that like my endpoint is timing out, it's not responding anymore, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go look at the logs from the application and try to understand what's broken. In a data pipeline context, once we get an alert from a metric, the thing that I wanna look at, probably the data. Uh, so I wanna actually look at rows of data that are causing my alert to fire so that I can actually see a sample and understand like, okay, what specific records are having a problem? what is uh, in common amongst those records, and this helps me start to drill down and understand the behavior inside the pipeline that's causing the issue. So in this case, uh, we have a query that's telling us about impacted rows. We've got about 5,000 impacted rows, and I can actually look at a preview of the data and start to understand what's going on inside uh, the data set. So this is our equivalent to logs for an SRE. So that's metrics and data. Next piece is lineage. So what's lineage? Lineage is the flow of the data through the pipeline and the relationships between the, the tables in the pipeline. I know this is like the hottest topic right now, lineage and DBT, pretty sweet. If you haven't checked it out, please do. Um, but it's super useful in a data observability context for debugging a problem in a pipeline, in particular in two directions. So this direction is sort of the upstream direction, right? So if this is the table where we've detected a problem, and we know that this is the parent table it comes from, and we know that here's another parent table that it comes from, and we also have metrics being collected on all these other tables here, and we see that none of the metrics on these tables are alerting, that helps us start to narrow down the scope of where the problem might be coming from. So a lot of times I'm responsible for this aggregate table. Someone else is responsible for the raw data that's a few layers upstream from me that's being landed in Snowflake. So if I can tell that the problem is actually originating up here in the raw layer, it's not my problem anymore. It's that guy's problem, right? So this is great news for me bad news for him, but either way, we're cutting down a whole bunch of debugging time because we can trace the root cause all the way upstream. So here's the other place that's useful, is going downstream. So if I have an issue and I wanna understand, uh, you know, do I need to wake up and fix this right now? Is this a thing I can fix tomorrow? This is not really a big deal and nobody needs to do anything about it, we can throw it in the backlog. The question is answered by, well, what's impacted if we do or don't do anything about the problem? So in this case, if I can trace uh, my lineage all the way down to a Tableau notebook, and I understand what users look at this notebook, that informs the context of the severity of the problem that I've been alerted about. So now I can decide what my response looks like. So 
The way that we construct this is by saying uh, the customer emails table, there's a query that loads data into this table, right? It says select from table A, insert into table B, right? That's running in your ETL pipeline. So if we parse that query, we can build an abstract syntax tree, right? So what we can do is we can break the query down and say, okay, here's the parent table, here are the child tables, and we can turn that from a text query into a, a tree structure, and we can start to use those tree structures to build the connections between all the nodes in the graph. Uh, now, at Uber, we have the advantage that we piped all of the queries for everybody through one layer where we can do parsing on all of the queries. So every user query, service account queries, the ETL system queries all got funneled uh, through one bottleneck. So we could just parse every query of the entire company, throw it through a parser, and we got an extremely detailed lineage graph for free, basically. This is much harder to do in a lot of companies that don't run all their queries through one single point uh, bottleneck, uh, or if they're using multiple ETL systems. So out in the wild, this is a much harder problem to solve. Um, so we had that luxury there because we were building everything sort of green field. Um, it's a much harder uh, problem for many companies, um, but it's an important one if you can solve it. So that's metrics, data, and lineage. And the last piece is alerts. So we have all this information in here. It helps us solve problems faster. It helps us understand what's affected by those problems. Um, but how does a human being know when to log into the product? Now, uh, as the guy who makes Big Eye, I would love if everybody just wanted to log into Big Eye at 9 a.m. with their coffee every morning. That'd look great. Um, but nobody does want to do that, right? Everybody has better things to do. The point of my product is to help you understand when something's wrong and you do need to take action. The rest of the time really wants to be in the background. Right? So we need an alerting system to tell a user that your attention is needed to solve some sort of a problem. Um, so we can use Slack for this. We can use PagerDuty for this. This can be webhooks. This can be API calls. The point is that the system needs a way of making an outbound call to a human being uh, once we have something that demands their attention. So that's the last piece. And then now we have a closed loop. We have a problem in our pipeline. We have our OSM. Our metrics should fire. Uh, that should generate an alert. Person can come in, they can look at a combination of uh, the data itself and lineage to understand what's going on, find the root cause of the problem, uh, and then go take that back to whoever you know, caused the issue and, and we get a resolution. So to summarize, who's using a data observability system? It's primarily data engineering. Data science and why this talk is interesting to give is because data science is a secondary stakeholder of a data observability system. Often the data science team, I hope, is not the ones who are actually going in and solving problems in the pipeline but as the people at the end of the pipeline who depend on those uh, results being accurate for your own work product, you need to know when something upstream from you is damaged, and you also need to know when it's been resolved. And so that makes data science the second most important stakeholder of a data observability platform, and it's usually the second team that my company tends to talk to when we're working with customers. So the how it works, we just talked about this. Metrics, data, and lineage are some, some of the key pieces, and we uh, looked at how those work, uh, and then the why. So model prep work, this is a big one, right? So I assume that everybody's had to do spot check queries before you summarize the data, you look at a bunch of scatter plots, you look at histograms, uh, you try to figure out, uh, is there a gap in the data, do I have negative values? Ideally, if you have data observability in place, you may not be able to completely eliminate that work, but a lot of the basics you should rely on are already being done for you. Uh, so that cuts down on model prep work time. More importantly, in my opinion, is model performance. So once we put a model into production, we need to be able to guarantee our stakeholders that that model is actually working, uh, and we can't constantly go and check model performance characteristics every morning to make sure that that's the case, right? So if we're monitoring the pipeline of the data that feeds the model, we can know, for example, if we have automated retraining going on, if we have a problem upstream in the pipeline, we may want to stop automated retraining from occurring because we might retrain on damaged training data and we might impact the model performance at five in the morning, you wake up, the model's not doing very well, well, why? Because it retrained on schedule and it retrained on bad data you didn't know about. Likewise, if we have serving data, uh, we were working with a customer who made recommendations in their product about things that you would want to uh, subscribe to that were occurring a week from now, two weeks from now, three weeks from now. What happens if the pipeline that contains those items that can be recommended stops getting new entries in it? The model keeps working, it keeps trying to uh, recommend what it can, but the things that it can recommend, it's running out of. So what it starts to do is it starts to recommend things that have already happened. And so now your users are getting recommendations about an event that's already happened and they can't go to it anymore. So they get confused, right? So uh, model uh, performance matters not just for training data, but also for serving data. Uh, 
and this customer flow. Ken is very happy. Uh, he's director of data science at Publix. Uh, and do I have time for the demo? Yeah, good. I got the thumbs up. Okay. So we're going to look at a demo starting with an alert. So here's an alert in Slack. Uh, not a whole lot to see here, but this tells me about you know what happened, where did it happen inside my data catalog, so what, what column, what table. Um, I have a severity score uh, that just tells me, you know, is this a, a strong deviation from what we'd expect from our anomaly detection models or not? Um, so I'm going to open this guy up, and we're going to look at a whole bunch of metrics. So here's a bunch of metrics, uh, and these metrics are distribution characteristics on data that's feeding a predictive model. So here we've got uh, max, min, median, variance, average, et cetera, and we can see over time, so this is the same numeric column, each of these is that uh, statistic over time, and we can see that we've recently had these drops, right? So what's happened is uh, the min dropped, the median dropped, the average dropped, the variance went up. Uh, what do you think happened? Outliers, exactly. So what we're actually looking at here is data from a company that uh, is a home building contracting platform, uh, and what happened, the backstory here, is that we had a new contractor on board, they're in New Mexico, uh, and they went to fill in information about the homes that they're building, and they left off a decimal point on the price of the, the contract, right? So every other customer would put in $24,537.65. They put in 23457, no decimals. So what do we do? We're now logging a bunch of data that is, you know, one-tenth the size, one-one-hundredth the size that we would normally expect for contract sizes. So now we've got a bunch of outliers in there that's pulling our mins down. Again, if we had a model, uh, that uh, depends on this data, for example, if I look here and I go to my lineage graph. So here's where we're having the problem. Uh, here is my model. And if I uh, open this up in Tableau, we can look at some of our uh, model predictions. So the, uh, the blue line is my actual values. The orange line is my predictive uh, values of what we expect to take in in revenue uh, each day from this contracting platform. Um, so my model has been performing reasonably well compared to uh, actuals. Here's the line of the actuals today. So what's gonna happen to my predictions if I don't find out about this issue? My predictions are gonna come down here like this. And then my head of revenue at this uh, contracting company is not gonna have a great day, which means I'm not gonna have a great day. So getting alerted about this in advance and being able to just drill in here and see what's at the end of my lineage pipeline allows me to very quickly understand what's gonna happen if I don't do something about this issue. It turns out this one's pretty important and I do wanna do something. Uh, so then I can use that graph and I can trace the problem upstream. So here's the set of parent tables that this one comes from. So these all get joined together to produce uh, this uh, training data set. Uh, and this table comes from this uh, uh, up here, which is in S3. So this is data in Snowflake, this is data in S3. So I can actually trace this all the way up to an issue that's in an S3 bucket. Uh, and so that tells me that we have some sort of problem not with our ETL pipeline, but actually with the raw data that's uh, being taken in from the customer. So this is probably an issue with them typing in the number in a form. We don't have front end validation, but the point is I now know in just a couple clicks that this isn't a problem with an ETL job. Uh, this isn't a problem with my training data set itself. Uh, we've got an issue with the way that we're recording data from the customer in the first place. And I also know what's impacted, and again, it's my uh, revenue officer's dashboard. And, you know, we don't want that one busted. So uh, this is a super quick demo. Um, I don't want to uh, go through the whole boring uh, product setup process and things like that. Uh, but hopefully this is like a quick peek into, in practice, what does data observability look like uh, and how does it help you know about a problem that is actually going to affect a production model and start to do something about it instead of finding out about that issue after uh, your revenue officer is uh, you know, yelling at you in Slack. So thanks for uh, attending my talk uh, and watching the demo. I'm going to be outside in the hallway right afterwards. Uh, have